Now um, let's uh, proceed with some uh, major unpinning techniques. And of course, pinning and unpinning uh, always uh, comes together, so we have to uh, be able to uh, do uh, both um, here. Uh, now, this, um, uh, in this position, a black's bishop is pinned on the d file since um, we don't want to lose the rook uh, when the bishop moves. But we also want a uh, bishop to move. In fact, of course, uh, this is uh, an instructive example, and that's why the fact that black is uh, a piece up in this particular position should not bother you. Yeah? It's just uh, to illustrate uh, the basic uh, techniques, uh, the basic possibilities of uh, how we can uh, go around the pin. Now, um, if you want the bishop to move, we have to do something about our rook on d6 being unprotected. And so, uh, there are several ways. We can remove uh, the piece from an unprotected square and put it somewhere where it can be protected. So, this is reasonably a uh, simple uh, method. Black can go rook d7. And now, although uh, the pin is still there, uh, black can proceed by going bishop e6 next move, for instance, after h3. Bishop e6, black solves his problem uh, along the d file, solves his problem uh, about the pin by uh, first putting his rook to a protected square and then removing the bishop. So now, okay, the bishop is, uh, the bishop has moved, there is uh, no problem. It's a reasonably simple method, but uh, of course uh, it will not always be available, so uh, we also have to learn some um, other, uh, other methods. And, in fact, sometimes they're surprisingly numerous, these uh, methods of unpinning. Uh, uh, since um, uh, the rook on d6 is not protected, uh, another logical uh, way to proceed is to actually protect it. So, we proceed king f8. The king is coming to e7, from where the rook on uh, d6 will be protected. So, let's make uh, just some moves, h3. King e7, taking h2, bishop e6. Once again, uh, our aim is accomplished, the bishop moved, the rook is protected. So, uh, another basic technique, if the piece is unprotected, first protect it, and then the pin piece will be uh, uh, mobile again. There are, these are like more normal uh, methods uh, of uh, doing this. Uh, however, sometimes uh, there are also tactical methods. For instance, in this position, uh, white has uh, back rank problems, and this means that rook can actually leave the d file, since now after rook d5, rook e1 will be made. So this is a more already more sophisticated, more tactical way of uh, dealing with the pin. Sometimes we uh, have to uh, be on the watch out for uh, this uh, kind of uh, usage of tactics in order to um, uh, to escape uh, escape from the pin. But we will also uh, proceed uh, to see with what kind of caution uh, black has to be uh, uh, doing this. For instance, in this particular example, after h3, now the bishop moves, and after rook d8, black has rook e8 or bishop e8. However, if with the same kind of an idea, black rook would have gone to c6, with the same idea of rook takes d5, rook c1 mate, uh, white by going h3, we in fact recreate the pin uh, along the d-file, although you might say there is nothing now left on the d-file, we can just move the bishop, but as a matter of fact, as we uh, saw previously uh, on uh, some examples from uh, the Morpheus game, the, the piece is sometimes spinned because it is covering a vital square. In this case, uh, the piece is spinned because after bishop e6, rook d8 will be checkmate. So, the piece is sort of pinned to, uh, 
to an important square it is protecting. So you see that there can be a serious difference between unpinning with, for instance, in this case with rook e6 or rook c6. So also when um, resorting to any kind of unpinning techniques, we have to uh, weigh uh, the uh, concrete properties of uh, the position uh, very carefully and uh, uh, find uh, the ones uh, which uh, suit us most whether we are on the defending side of the pin or on the active on the pinning side. So now let's make this uh, example uh, slightly more uh, complicated by adding uh, a pawn on uh, c2. Now in fact white has a direct threat. That is why is threatening c4, winning uh, the pinned piece. And now black of course will find his uh, uh, ways out of the pin um, are far more limited. The, uh, the slow method, king f8, doesn't work because it only uh, threatens to uh, protect the rook, but in fact it is not protecting the rook yet. And uh, now c4 uh, wins uh, the bishop. So black has to uh, resort to uh, the more active uh, ways of uh, protecting uh, or of more active ways uh, of defending against the pin, of unpinning, and um, uh, has to uh, find uh, those and implement those in this position. So the other method we looked at was rook d7, and in fact it is proving very stable uh, in this position since rook d7 already threatens bishop e6. So we uh, solve the problem of the pin in this way c4, bishop e6, or bishop c6, and uh, basically we got what we wanted, the bishop is unpinned, there is no problem. Now, uh, the more tactical ways uh, we looked at, with the presence of the pawn on c2, we already have to be uh, way more careful using uh, the tactical method. Uh, for instance, rook e6 works here as before, with the same justification, that after c4, black will go bishop c6, and defend against the back rank made with rook d8, rook e8. So this works, but okay, rook c6 clearly cannot work, since now uh, rook c1 is uh, no longer made, and white can uh, take the bishop on d5. But uh, what happens if black moves the rook, for instance, to b6? Now, after rook takes d5, rook b1 is made, but now c4 shows that uh, the piece is still pinned, that is the bishop cannot go, although the rook has been removed from d6, because the bishop, as we said before, is covering an important square, d8, and uh, wherever the bishop goes, rook d8 will be made, and white actually wins the piece. So you see, whenever uh, we a add a certain element to the position as the pawn on c2 in this uh, case, creating a direct threat, the uh, opportunities of the defending uh, side become way more limited. And uh, uh, thus, uh, in real tournament practice, when there are usually many more pieces, uh, many more possibilities, uh, the uh, unpinning, unpinning becomes uh, a bit more complicated. So if we add the knight on g3 instead of the pawn on uh, instead of the pawn on uh, c2, now we can see that white actually uh, has uh, some uh, possibilities to uh, to attack the bishop on d5 by going knight f5. Now first, uh, white is attacking the rook but also white is creating the threat of knight e7 check. And now we can see uh, how uh, intricate uh, the defense of uh, uh, the pinned piece uh, may uh, actually uh, become. After knight f5, if black goes rook d7, covering, you could say, both uh, bishop on d5 and the threat knight e7. White wins uh, with uh, an elementary combination, rook takes d5, rook takes d5, knight e7 check. 
and the normal double attack uh, decides the issue. However, Black, seeing this, undoubtedly will uh, resort to some uh, to some other some better ways of uh, unpinning. His uh, opportunities now are even further limited due to the fact that the rook is hanging on d6, so only the moves which save the rook um, can uh, come into consideration. The rook cannot go to square like a6, because the knight e7 wins the piece directly. And of course not rook d5, because of rook a1. So what about our uh, old uh, solid method to go rook e6? In fact, this is the move which is really covering the square e7. The knight e7 is no longer a consideration. And black is uh, preparing uh, bishop c6, uh, finally unpinning. Now, if white w were to attack the pinned bishop with knight e3, then, uh, as we already learned, bishop c6, rook d8, rook e8, will uh, solve, uh, solve the problem. White can be uh, trickier than that and uh, proceed by creating the threat of rook d5. Now, rook d5 uh, here is once again not possible because of uh, rook e1. Uh, why can't uh, make a move like, for instance, h3? White uh, creates a threat rook d5. And now the bishop is still uh, still finding itself uh, pinned. Uh, we still have to do something about the fact that uh, it is hanging. And um, here, uh, black can save himself uh, with uh, two different techniques. So, uh, the simple technique just protecting the pin piece, once again doesn't work because of rook takes d5, winning the piece. Thus, uh, black has to find uh, something more uh, elaborate, and uh, in this case he can actually use counter-attack to uh, uh, solve the problem of a pin. That is, the bishop is hanging on d5, but black can go g6. And uh, if white takes the bishop, black takes the knight. However, depending on how many pieces uh, there are uh, uh, in the position, uh, this uh, uh, kind of counter-attack might become uh, very complicated to use. In this particular position, uh, rook d5, gf, rook f5 would bring about uh, the ending which black would still have to defend carefully. And uh, thus, bishop c6. Our old trustworthy solution seems to be the best again. However, here we have to uh, pay attention to one other detail. That um, although uh, rook d8 does not win here, uh, it is still um, very, very tricky. Because now the defense with rook e8 actually no longer works. Since now there is a new pin along the back rank, and uh, white now, with this knight on f5, has uh, resources to use it. That is, although rook takes e8, bishop e8, would lead to a draw, knight e7 check, however, simply wins the bishop on c6. Once again, uh, the uh, black's control of the square e7 is an illusion. The rook cannot go there, that's why the square is not controlled, it's an empty, uncontrolled square. Knight e7 simply wins the bishop on c6. King f8, knight takes c6. And whilst white was able also to protect the rook on d8 in the process, uh, white will emerge a piece up. So here black would have to go bishop e8. And although the bishop is also pinned, black will be able to defend himself by simply protecting uh, the bishop, knight d6, king f8. And um, uh, 
uh, and the bishop is uh, finally uh, safely protected and uh, black is fine. For instance, after, say, g4, it might look that black is still experiencing a very unpleasant pin uh, of the bishop and cannot move, but we are using uh, some slight tactical motive and go king e7, rook e8, king takes d6, and finally we can be uh, completely confident about the um, peaceful uh, outcome of this particular game. And um, you will be probably surprised to see uh, how many uh, uh, tactical intricate details that are in this very simple position, and most of them are connected uh, to the usage of pins and careful uh, unpinning. That's why when I say that um, the confident um, recognition of uh, pins and um, patterns connected uh, to pins uh, is actually essential uh, for uh, your chess development and for successful tournament, tournament practice. And even in this position, even having uh, done all that, we have not yet exhausted everything which was connected to a pin. For instance, if we go back several moves and look at this position again, uh, we notice that uh, White, in fact, has a double attack at his disposal. White goes knight d4. And now, uh, how uh, should Black react to this double attack? Since uh, if we would just remove the rook, knight c6, rook c6, rook d8, would be actually made. He uh, has to use himself for the first time in this example. He has to be the pinning side and go uh, rook d6. And black saves himself uh, by actually pinning the white knight. Now knight c6, rook d1 uh, wins for black. So in fact now white has to do something about uh, the uh, suddenly existing pin. So now, by now, I think you are sufficiently versatile uh, to um, understand that white will have different uh, resources here to uh, save himself uh, from the pin. Uh, I will uh, indicate a um, couple of them. So, moving the rook to a protectable square is one of them. Next move of white will be knight of three, and uh, the pin problem will be solved. And uh, another method would be to use uh, tactical means and go, for instance, rook b1. And uh, the salvation comes in form of mate on b8. So black has to uh, do something about it, and then uh, the game will be drawn. So you see how, uh, how uh, various... Uh, how various usage of pins and unpinning can uh, enable us to steer clearly through uh, complications in the game. And that was not even a very complicated example. Uh, they, will, uh, they will get, um, uh, the patterns will get more difficult to uh, recognize, the pins will get more complicated as we will move on uh, to um, practical uh, examples. Um, before we proceed to those, let me just show you one more position. This is uh, basically the same position uh, that we just uh, uh, looked at, only with the difference that uh, the white king is on uh, h1. This creates an additional uh, possibility for black, which is purely tactical, that is that uh, the pinned piece can leave the square with a check. And uh, we will also see later from uh, practical examples that this actually, this does happen uh, frequently in uh, tournament practice and uh, can be extremely effective. And in this case, black can go bishop takes g2, king g2, rook takes d1, and unpin due to the fact that bishop g2 was the check, which also means uh, that whenever calculating in a game of chess, uh, such details like whether the king is on h1 or on g1, they are actually uh, very major and uh, should never be completely disregarded. This said, uh, I think we uh, have uh, looked enough at the basics, at uh, the uh, major ways of pinning and pinning, of using the pin. 
and um, I suggest we uh, proceed uh, with um, uh, examples from practical games. As far as uh, the examples from practical games are concerned, uh, I would uh, suggest the following that um, I uh, will not mention uh, the names of players since uh, these games uh, were taken from uh, the tournament practice of the players of the most uh, different level. I went through a lot of club games, uh, went through a lot of grandmaster practice and um, at the end I think what is important to us is uh, the positions and the moves and the pieces and uh, we will uh, see from, um, from these uh, examples how in fact in real life uh, the pins uh, decide the outcome of the battle.